Welcome, everybody. Uh, my name is Joe Young, and I'm a professor in the School of International Service and School of Public Affairs. Uh, I'm going to be the moderator for this excellent event, and I already see there's a good number of people already here, and this is, this is great. Um, this discussion is going to last about 45 minutes among our participants, and then we're going to have about 15 minutes at the end for Q&A. If you would like to ask a question, just submit through the Q&A function. I'll, I'll be watching that uh, at the bottom of your Zoom window. There's also closed captioning available for those who need it. You can click on the option at the bottom of your screens. We ask that no one record this session. We'll be recording the webinar and it'll be available on the SIS YouTube channel. So with those preliminaries out of the way, uh, we're talking about counterterrorism uh, in this particular event uh, post 9-11. And I have three outstanding um, panelists that we're going to get that I'm going to introduce you to. First, I'd like to introduce you to uh, Professor Audrey Kurth Cronin. Let's see, do we have a picture of her? She's coming up. Uh, she's the Distinguished Professor of International Security and Founding Director of a AU Center for Security, Innovation, and New Technology. On 9-11, Professor Co uh, Cronin was at Georgetown University. She was teaching courses on terrorism. As the day's events unfolded, she discussed the situation live on NPR's Morning Edition. She then left Georgetown for Capitol Hill to become uh, the specialist in terrorism at the Congressional Research Service, responsible for advising members in the aftermath of the attacks. In her best known book, which is How Terrorism Ends, which I have a copy of right here because I assigned to all my classes, um, she, she talks a, a ton about you know, how, how terrorist groups begin and end. Um, and her most recent book, Power to the People, which is also right here, How Open Technological <laughs> Innovation is Arming Tomorrow. I had it ready for you. Is You're Arming so Tomorrow kind. <laughs> Terrorist. Uh, and it won a, a big award recently for the most significant, original, relevant, and practically valuable contribution to the un understanding of terrorism. So welcome. Thank you, Joe. Thank you for that kind introduction. We're looking forward to hearing from you. And so next up, we have Move and Shake who's a former security intelligence and counterterrorism operative. He testifies as an expert for the UN, NATO, US, Canada, so all sorts of government agencies. His commentary has appeared in all the biggest uh, news outlets, CNN, CBC, ABC. Sheikh is currently a professor of public safety at Seneca College, and he's also a counter extremism specialist for the US-based NGO Parents for Peace. Welcome. Thank you for having me. Good to see you. Uh, and finally, our third panelist is Aaron Zellin, who's the Richard Burrow Fellow at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy, a visiting research uh, and a visiting research scholar in the Department of Politics at Brandeis University. He's also the founder of jihad jihadology.net, which is an amazing primary source, has amazing primary source materials if you're interested uh, in checking it out. He's the author of of the book, Your Sons Are At Your Service, Tunisia's Missionaries of Jihad, a Columbia University Press book from this past year. And Zelen's research focuses on Sunni Arab jihadis, jihadi groups in North Africa and Syria, as well as foreign fighting, online jihadism, and jihadi governance. Welcome, Aaron. Thanks for having me. So I wanted to start uh, with a question for Audrey. Uh, as someone who's studied terrorism for a long time and was involved in counterterrorism policy prior to 9-11. Can you talk about counterterrorism before 9-11 and the immediate shifts in policy we saw post 9-11? And what changes did you see were successful or failures? Sure. Um, remember, I'm going to be focusing mainly on the United States uh, because that's what I know best in terms of the policy world. Before 9-11, recall that we had a wall between domestic and international uh, intelligence collection. There was no Ministry of the Interior, as most countries would have. Federal, state, and local agencies were uncoordinated. They didn't co you know, cooperate or really share information well. Some people warned of an imminent attack by al-Qaeda, but those people, even Richard Clark in the White House, was saying it might be an attack that cost hundreds of um, casualties. Nobody thought it would be thousands. And uh, the CIA had just gotten permission to hire additional analysts to study Al-Qaeda, and they had a hard time filling 10 positions. So that was before 9-11. After 9-11, let me point out and remind everyone that people were really scared. I was here in Washington. It's very easy to do the hindsight analysis now, 20 years later, 
But uh, you have to really understand that people feared that there would be another attack coming. And we had the anthrax attacks within three weeks after that on Capitol Hill. And then the next year we had the DC sniper uh, killer who was, you know, killing young people and kids at, at times. It was very, very high anxiety in Washington. So that's the setting. Um, then we passed the 2001 AUMF, the Authorization for the Use of Military Force. Very important to understand that document, just to understand where the policy went. That document was oriented towards nations, organizations, or people who had attacked the United States on 9-11. So the words Afghanistan and Al-Qaeda don't appear anywhere in it. Uh, and so we had no clear definition of who the enemy was. But you've asked what the successes and failures are, and I'll go through them fairly quickly, not to use up too much time. We founded the Department of Homeland Security. That was November of 2002. The 9-11 Commission led to better integration of international and domestic um, intelligence. We established the National Counterterrorism Center, which was specifically oriented toward integrating that intelligence. Uh, we built effective financial safeguards, particularly for traditional banking. Um, of course, then we went into the war in Afghanistan, which I personally believe was a legitimate response to the attacks. There had to be some kind of a response. We may disagree about that. I'm happy to be debated with. And um, those were the, the successes. Starting with the failures, I would say that our failure to prevent bin Laden to escape into Tora Bora was the first thing. Secondly, the uh, war in Iraq, the invasion of Iraq was an enormous strategic mistake and failure, uh, really monumental. I, I argued against it at the time. And um, overall, I would say that there's no question that the United States overreacted in terms of its policy response. At least 263 US government organizations were created or organized. There were more than 1,000 government organizations and 2,000 private contractor organizations that were dealing with counterterrorism or homeland security or intel. And so this became a kind of a juggernaut. And that juggernaut began as the years went by to define practically any problem as terrorism. And sometimes that's not what it was at all. So um, it became something that was very difficult to build nuance into. So that would be my overview of what happened policy-wise before and after. So would you, would you say that there were some kind of immediate successes, like you were saying DHS reorganization and in um, Afghanistan and um, sort of keeping bin Laden out of certain things and then midterm kind of failures or sort of long-term failures or would, would you think about categorizing those into sort of different buckets? Yeah, I don't think there's a way to do that chronolo chronologically because we had smart moves immediately, but we also had dumb moves. So when we declared a war on terrorism or war on terror, technically, you know, a lot of us argued against that too. But um, the, the comeback was we need to be able to pull our allies together and everybody has, you know, everybody can agree that terror is a bad thing. So, you know, I lost that argument. And so did some of my colleagues. Um, I think the AUMF, the way it was framed, enormously increased executive power. And it was deliberately written that way. We had never had an authorization for to go to war with a person, for example. That was an amazing, I think that was an error. Um, but many of the other things that we did immediately in the aftermath were wise. And then we had other errors as we went, went on. And, and I think the war in Iraq was the biggest one. Um, move in and Aaron, I, I was wondering if there was anything on this topic that you wanted to jump in and say, or if you wanted to add or discuss anything on this point. Okay, we're, we're okay. All right, so I will ask Mubin a question then, which is, you know, again, similar to Audrey's experience as, as, as a former intelligence and CT operative, what shifts in operations did you see since 9-11 and were there differences in say the US versus other countries and specific you know, Canadian responses uh, that you witnessed? Yeah, thanks for that. Um, and uh, Professor Cronin, Cronin uh, really laid out um, you know, really well successes and failures, because I think it's from that environment and context that we start to see all these operations. Um, people were scared. Uh, people really didn't know, you know, what exactly the threat was, what it looked like. And so I think in the beginning, uh, kind of continuing the mistakes that were made, uh, you know, in the U.S., there was this, uh, especially from the NYPD's Intel Analysis Unit, not knocking the NYPD, great people, but uh, the wide net spying approach that was taken just was was not good at all. Was a big big failure. 
uh, not just in the fact that it failed to produce even a single prosecution, um, but also it uh, really poisoned the relations between the Muslim community in America. And, um, and I think this is something that people really haven't really understood the gravity of because, you know, we, we need the community uh, to be working together. And unfortunately, what, what starts to happen is because of this appearance that this was, you know, we were just going after anybody that was like overtly Muslim, uh, people in the community realized that, well, why would they want to work for uh, a security system that they perceived was actually, you know, working against them? So I think there was a, a narrative value here that was lost uh, in that wide net spying approach. Then you find uh, sting operations were another um, tool that, and and I think sting operations are used in other you know criminal type of investigations, whether it's organized crime, uh, biker gang, uh, child sex predators. Uh, and what happened is there is this perception that there was an over reliance on these sting operations. Uh, there is a matter of debate on this, so I'm willing to be uh, debated on this as well. I think there is a a mistake that in the public perception about what undercover operations are. Uh, sometimes what's, what happened, I think, is people were conflating the mere presence of an undercover with entrapment. And so I you know, kept hearing entrapment almost used as an excuse to, to not accept the fact that, yes, there are bad people up to no good and you know, of their own accord. Not everything is a setup by the FBI. Um, so this perception problem was another, I think, just exacerbated that distrust between communities. So these these operations, I mean, these are standard operations doing, you know, sting operations or other other undercover type of operations. And this, you know, kicked off in the in the U.S. Of course, Canada and the U.S. We're you know we're very tightly connected uh, when it comes to these sorts of things. The intelligence sharing, information sharing, uh, it's you know it goes back. I mean, to World War II really. Uh, and so Canada started to do the same things, um, maybe not as aggressively as it was being done in the U.S., um, but but still aggressive nonetheless. And the third thing I would say uh, is really the introdu introduction of legislation to prosecute uh, individuals on terrorism offenses. So even Canada, we had our Anti-Terrorism Act um, shortly after the, the U.S. You know, kind of started that process. So. So that, that's the kind of things that we saw immediately after 9-11. We started to see plots forming right away. I mean, right by the end of you know 2001, uh, you had uh, Zachariah Mousawis, who was uh, you know convicted, uh, Richard Reed, the shoe bomber, um, you know, for you know because of whom we all have to take our shoes off at the airport. And we ask ourselves, like, do we really need to take our shoes off at the airport now? So it, it almost became this monster of response to a problem that was so, it was, it's, it's very complex, of course, and it could not really be, I think, captured by this machine sledgehammer approach that we saw after 9-11. Yeah, it's, it's very interesting that you brought up the wide net sort of spying techniques and, uh, you know, the U.S. has all of these uh, lists you can be on and that are filled with lots of folks, right? Uh, and the efficacy of those things have been very um, challenged, let's say. And, and so are you saying the alternative to that is maybe, you know, again, putting CT resources more in things like these sting operations, or is there some other thing that you would sort of go, well, okay, those wide net approaches don't really work, but these alternatives are, are potentially better. Yeah. Wide net surveillance just doesn't work. It, it just creates too much noise and uh, you're, you don't have any, you know, as many analysts, maybe they're, you know, hiring more people, whatever, but it's just more information for, for people to have to look through. Uh, when, when, when it's, I think we've learned, you know, um, moving away from religious profiling and things like that, like those things don't work. Like asking somebody how many times they pray has like zero relevance to terrorism or stopping terrorist plots. All it does is it just makes Muslims feel like, oh, you're really just against my religion. You're not going against terrorism per se. Um, so I would strongly, strongly encourage that, you know, this wide net spying just doesn't work. They really need to rebuild relations with communities because it's communities from where this information comes uh you know extremists who are operating in the fringes of of islamic society like the you know there's not a single plot that emerges from a mainstream muslim mosque it just doesn't happen because for anybody who's gone to a mosque i mean if you go for friday prayers 
there a lot of them are just reading uh, pre pre prepared or pre written Arabic speeches, which have nothing to do with politics. Just praising God, praising the Prophet, quote a verse from the Quran. You know, take a pause, pray a little bit, get up, and just do the same thing again, and then prayers. So stupid things like sending uh, surveillance, you know, uh, to mosques, uh, as if like the imam is going to slip up and reveal like the latest, you know, terrorist plot. It's just, you know, it's just, it, it makes no sense. So I, I am a, I'm, I'm biased because I was a part of a sting operation, and I do believe sting operations are very effective. Um, just because you you think you're talking to who you think is an ISIS leader or an Al Qaeda facilitator or a 12 year old girl in the case of child predators, it's the same tactic that's used. Like you just got caught, um, and so. But we need to, I think, be careful with that narrative because then, back to what I was saying earlier, this idea that the mere presence of an undercover equals entrapment, I think, is problematic because it's taking away from a very effective um, interdiction tool. Okay, awesome. Uh, Audrey or Aaron, is there anything you'd like to comment here? Okay, um, Aaron, so, you know, Audrey and Mubin both gave us a sense of how the state was responding to these violent groups. But I wonder if you might give us a better sense for how the groups were responding to the state and, and this adapted and how they adapted to this changing environment. Yeah, definitely. Uh, I think there are five things that I'm going to point out. It's important to remember that on 9-11, there are only 200 members of Al-Qaeda itself. Um, I think we tend to forget that. Um, that being said, in response uh, and the Afghan invasion, the U.S. targeted other groups that were based in Afghanistan as well. And in many ways, that helped create sort of this unipolar moment within the jihadi movement, where prior to 9-11, there was sort of competition between Al-Qaeda and these other more localized groups. Um, but as a consequence of the loss of their safe haven, um, as well as the beginning of uh, the Iraq war, um, which provided a new space for them to operate, we saw Al Qaeda in particular creating a number of branches so that they were able to spread out leadership, but also um, build infrastructures in different locations. So obviously we know AQAP, originally Al Qaeda in Iraq, AQIM, Al Shabaab, uh, first Jabhat al Nusra, then later Hura Sadin. And then more recently with Al Qaeda in the Indian subcontinent. Um, on top of this, we also saw, at least in the Western context, some local feeder groups being created, which helped create sort of this grassroots momentum locally. Groups like Al Muhajirun in the UK, um, Sharia for Belgium, Revolution Muslim in the US, et cetera. Um, and this provided a space for individuals to operate locally in the West beyond just going abroad. Um, and in relation to this, Post 9-11, you also saw the proliferation of these online spaces, which was really key for them to continue to push forward. Um, of course, jihadis were using the internet prior to 9-11. They had these static web pages going all the way back to like 92, 93 or so. However, 2002, 3, 4, you started to see the growth of these password protected forums where it wasn't just the groups putting out propaganda, but individuals were able to interact with each other, connect, and also comment on different pieces of propaganda, which provided an initial community. Of course, we know that this further exploded later on with the onset of social media and Twitter in particular. Everybody, I think, uh, has heard the story now about ISIS and the way that they've been able to exploit that. Um, but one of the aspects of this too that was important is that uh, the movement, uh, Al-Qaeda in particular, they started to translate this content from Arabic to sort of idiomatic English, as well as other languages, French, German, Spanish, Indonesian, what have you. And therefore this, again, further broadened the scope of who could potentially get involved in, and be involved in this movement. One thing that's important to note though, um, as a consequence of sort of this localization of the movement because of these branches being created is that you've had this divergent in me methodologies over time. So of course I mentioned that, you know, in the, the initial years after 9-11, you had like, Al-Qaeda is this big brand name group. Um, but since we've seen, of course, now with the Islamic State, um, you know, breaking off and doing their own thing. And then more recently in Syria, you've had Hayat Tahrir Sham, which originally was Jabhat al-Nusra and Al-Qaeda's official branch there. Um, they themselves uh, disaffiliated themselves. And unlike ISIS, which went more extreme, HTS became a bit more pragmatic. Um, and then one of the things that's important to keep in mind is that uh, because of 
the greater opportunities that occurred, especially in the last 10 years in the aftermath of the Arab uprisings, this further embedded a lot of local and regional focus within the movement. Of course, we've seen that they've continued to be interested in doing external operations or inspiring people to do uh, homegrown attacks in the West. Um, but because there's more opportunities locally, we have to remember that you know 9-11 uh, was supposed to make it so as the US would stop supporting Arab regimes locally um, because their, uh, you know, their end goal was essentially to then overthrow these regimes and then create their Islamic states. Um, or one big caliphate in the end. So the fact that there's these more localized opportunities really fed into what their medium to longer term goals actually were. And in relation to this, especially for um, Al Qaeda and HTS in particular, they started to reach out to populations more as a consequence of the extreme violence that we saw in Iraq. Uh, they realized that they needed to be less elitist in some respects and really explain their ideology to populations. And as a result of this more localized or regional focus and the fact that there's more opportunities, they've been able to implement more social services and proto-governance. And that's one of the reasons why we now see places like in Afghanistan, a new Taliban state in Northwest Syria, you see HTS controlling a local government in parts of Syria. And then the Sahel region, you see something similarly with AQIM there as well as ISIS in Nigeria and the like. Um, so they've been able to do a lot of things actually. And one of the things you said, I think that's a really, really amazing point is how small Al Qaeda was when this all kind of started, right? And, it, and I guess it was kind of implied, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it was sort of implied that Iraq was one of the things that helped it really explode. I mean, obviously 9-11, but, but Iraq as well. And I wonder kind of as a counterfactual, what do you think would have happened had the US not invaded Iraq? I mean, would this, would this be a different movement or would we see things sort of the same as we see them today? It's difficult to say, obviously. Um, I think if the US would have focused directly on Afghanistan and the regional networks that were sort of based in Pakistan too, I, I would imagine that there still would be a jihadi movement. Um, it would probably be a lot less, uh, it would be smaller, I would think. Um, and it wouldn't have created the space for people to join in a way or get excited in a way that was seen as not just part of like bin Laden's ideology, but sort of an anti-imperialist or neo-colonial type of endeavor too. Um, because one of the things to remember is that, of course, the jihadis were able to take advantage of this, but it was deeply unpopular in the whole Arab and Muslim world. And even in, you know, other Western countries, I mean, we have to remember, obviously, you know, the whole issue of recalling French fries, freedom fries, because France was against the invasion. It sounds so absurd now, but this was the reality. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, Audrey or Mubin, do you, do you want to say anything on this point? Well, I will if you're if I can just jump sure. in. I, I, actually, I couldn't agree with you more that we lost an enormous opportunity when uh, and, and I've written about this, but when Al Qaeda became much less popular among its own purported followers um, in about 2009, uh, you know, bin Laden's personal popularity, according to the Pew polls, were, was very low. Number of Muslims who were very angry about Al-Qaeda because of all the suicide attacks. Countries that had suffered from suicide attacks by the end of that decade were the ones where there had been a huge shift from supporting Al-Qaeda and being, being sort of excited in the aftermath of the attacks to enormous condemnation of Al-Qaeda, places like Pakistan and Jordan. And, you know, we lost an enormous opportunity. We, we tried to um, capitalize on that. The other opportunity that we lost, I think, um, by not capitalizing on it enough was the death of bin Laden. I did not think that the death of bin Laden was going to end Al Qaeda. But nonetheless, I don't think that, um, y y you know, the war on terror, so, so to speak, sort of lost its bearing and kind of dragged on for another 10 years for reasons that I'm not entirely sure were worthy because not only did we invade Iraq, but we also took our attention away from Afghanistan, which is where the people that we were trying to attack were. So, so we, we became, it wasn't just mission creep. It was like global creep in how we thought about what it was we were trying to accomplish, I think. So I think Aaron, you're absolutely right is my point. Yeah. I just wanted to pipe in to, to say, cause as uh, Aaron was kind of mapping that time period, um, late nineties. And so, I guess a, a part of my background, which it wasn't mentioned, um, was, you know, I was a radicalized 
individual at that time, I became a supporter of Taliban, the relatively unknown Al-Qaeda. In 1995, it's so surreal because 26 years ago exactly, uh, I was in Quetta and Mastung uh, in Pakistan. Basically, I met the Taliban. It was by chance. Uh, for those of you who know, I was with a group called the Tabligh Jamaat, uh, which is able to operate in these areas because they're non-political and Taliban doesn't bother them, they bother Taliban. Um, and so uh, even from 95 onwards, all the things that were happening in the world at the time, like the biggest thing was also the uh, the Chechen war in uh, uh, against the Russians. And uh, that was a time, you know, I fantasize about going to to fight there as a foreign fighter. Uh, I think by 97, 98 is when the Russian Hell series of uh, CDs came out, the first real jihadi video uh, collection, if you will, um, you know, where it was, you know, I saw my first beheading video. Uh, even me saying it, I can still remember that beheading video it was a Russian soldier who, was, uh, who had his neck cut off by uh, Khatab, uh, the famous uh, Chechen fighter. Uh, and so just as we get into the early 20s and so on, and so by 2004 is when I began my government work and I was infiltrating those password protected chat forums, um, you know, pal talk and a lot of the uh, really old stuff. Um, and I'm, I'm, I am that old enough, I guess, to say that I was around when like it was still AOL chat in 1992 and Yahoo chat. It was like text based programming. So by the time we're in 2004 onwards, uh, just to kind of build on what you're asking of Aaron in terms of how the movements were responding, they were now also starting to generate their own propaganda and disseminate it freely and openly. Uh, a lot of the uh, IED attacks that were being done by Al-Qaeda's Arqawi's group against U.S. troops uh, were featured in video clips that you could download from these uh, from these forums. And you had a lot of young militant, you know, uh, Muslims who were really um, engaging this stuff in a way it just never was before uh, because a lot of this stuff it was out there but you really needed to be plugged into the networks to get uh, but now as we get to 2004 and onwards it just became uh, readily available everywhere so that was i think another uh, output of that environment yeah i think that's a good point and actually a, a question that i wanted to ask aaron which is related to that is because you mentioned the sort of uh, potential desire to be a foreign fighter and uh, you know, one of the things that we've seen more recently is foreign fighters being part of conflict and uh, especially since since 9-11. And they've been a part of conflict for a long time. Um, but in this post 9-11 world, we certainly have seen a, see a rise in conflicts that have these foreign fighters. And I, I wanted to ask about some lessons or policy prescriptions that, that we might take away from this. Yeah, they definitely have. Um, though it is important to note that up until Syria, uh, the Syrian war this past decade, the largest foreign fighter mobilization was actually in the 1980s in Afghanistan against the Soviet Union. Um, uh, that being said, of course, it's, it's definitely accelerated in the last decade uh, uh, because of um, the ease of getting to Syria and the fact that it was seen as a, a legitimate space to go since many countries were actually against the Assad regime, even if they didn't necessarily agree with uh, you know, the jihadi groups that these people would join. Um, I think it's important to note that you know, foreign fighting is more popular than people getting involved in terrorist attacks. I know that a lot of the policy discussion as well as governments, they primarily focus on the violent actions that individuals take in their own home countries, the US, Canada, or Western Europe. Um, of course, it's totally understandable. Um, and there's political pressure to do something. But if you look at sort of the history of the jihadi movements, um, in many ways, most people see foreign fighting as a more legitimate form of action since it's, uh, it's seen as uh, better within the ideology than doing terrorism itself. Um, so I think that that's important to keep in mind, even though um, it's understandable that governments um, respond more so to violence in their own home countries. Um, another lesson that I think has been learned is that local feeder groups that I alluded to before, um, not just in the West, but even in the Arab world too, I'm thinking of groups like the series of Ansar al-Sharia groups that were created after the Arab uprisings uh, were key locus points for these foreign fighter recruitments. So this, this uh, mobilization of individuals going, it doesn't just come out of nowhere. There are these 
networks that have histories to them. There's logistics and facilitation that goes into it. And each sort of foreign fighter mobilization adds on to it. And therefore, unlike in the 80s where they're sort of uh, starting things from scratch now, they have these very mature networks. So even if certain parts of these networks are taken down, there's still other aspects of it uh, that remain up. In terms of policy, I think uh, we need to think about this in different sort of uh, phases of the cycle of foreign fighting. There's obviously pre-travel before somebody goes. There's somebody that's in the theater when they do arrive. There's somebody that could potentially be detained abroad. And then there's, of course, people that have returned home as returnees. And therefore, I think the approaches need to be different based off of all this. And also the tools that governments have are much different too. So in terms of the first and last ones, pre-travel or returnees, the local state will have much more control over the process since they're in their own home territory. Um, so whether it's on the front end, there could be more preventative type of tools, whether it's trying to get somebody to do various off ramps related to, um, you know, talking to social workers or psychologists or religious uh, figures um, to potentially arresting somebody if it passes that threshold. And similarly, we're looking at this on the back end too, when somebody returns in terms of depending on whether they did a crime or not when they're abroad um, and whether they might have information on other people and how that could get involved as well. Um, and sort of this issue of rehabilitation and reintegration, which I think is, is important since, um, you know, especially in Europe, they don't have long prison sentences. So they're likely to be back out on the streets again. In theater, it's obviously a bit more uh, complicated. Obviously, the favorite tool that's been used uh, has been the drone strike, um, especially those involved in planning external operations or key senior leaders. Um, and then detained abroad, that's a very complicated issue. We've been seeing this, especially in relation to Northeast Syria in particular in the last few years, where you have men detained in prisons, as well as women and children, these IDP camps where a number of countries are trying to strip uh, dual citizens of their citizenship or people don't want to bring them home because they're seen as threats or they don't feel like they have enough evidence to prosecute them um, in jails. And therefore, it's created all these policy dilemmas, but just leaving these people out there is going to create other problems going forward, especially if, um, say, a jihadi group returns or they're broken out of prison. We've seen that one of the ways that these movements historically have been able to replenish themselves is through prison breaks. Um, so it's, it's definitely something that needs to be thought about harder. And also there needs to be more pressure on governments to actually bring their own citizens to justice instead of pawning it off on other countries that might not have the capabilities to deal with it in the long term. Okay, I wanted to shift back to Audrey for a moment uh, to ask about, I mean, we've talked a lot about government changes and governmental changes, but uh, you know, academia, as, as you well know, has changed a, a lot since 9-11. Uh, and what sorts of new things do you think we've learned about CT and terrorism since 9-11? I, I say we as an academic. Yeah, okay. So I, I think my job is sort of to set the big picture context and I'm sure that my colleagues will add a lot more specific detail, but let me just kind of give it an over, overall perspective. Um, before 9-11, terrorism, the study of terrorism in the United States and internationally was done by very few people. And it was not really considered a very legitimate area for focus. Most people who studied terrorism worked at government sponsored places like RAND or at established institutes abroad, um, very, very good institutes uh, like the St. Andrews Terrorism Center in Scotland. Most people who studied terrorism were looking at either left wing groups in the United States, they were focusing on the Middle East and especially the Israeli Palestinian conflict, or they had studied the IRA. That's where the major kind of pots of money were and where the people who were who had actually done field studies and who had the, the kind of depth in their understanding of cultural regions. Um, so, you know, remember in the United States in the 1970s, there were some 400 terrorist attacks every year. So it was, you know, a huge amount of terrorism in the United States. And there was a heavy focus in the U.S. on studying left wing groups. I remember a working group that we had in the late 1990s. It had maybe 12 or 14 people on it. And um, very few of us were actually uh, academics and it was an international group at the Institute of Peace. So it was a very, very small group. 
Um, there were problems with data in the United States. We only had the patterns of global terrorism annual U.S. State Department report, which I used to cover very heavily when I was on the Hill. There were problems with that data, and I used to, you know, get involved in trying to help them fix it or make them fix it. The MIPT database that um, was established in the aftermath of the Oklahoma City attacks, and it was built on the foundation of the Pinkerton Intelligence Agency uh, collection of, of incidents. And it was only strong from about the late 60s onward. And that eventually evolved into the START database, which was a great improvement after 9-11. So we had better data after 9-11. Um, we had virtually no data on domestic terrorism. There, was, there were incident reports within FBI. Most of those were not public. Uh, the whole field was criticized for, for depending much too much on secondary sources, not having primary data, as I've already mentioned, not being theoretical enough, not defining terrorism strictly enough in consistent ways. But on the other hand, it was heavily interdisciplinary. And we had a lot of people who had done field work and knew the cultures and the languages of the places that they studied. So that was the, I think, countervailing advantage before 9-11. After 9-11, the data problems got better, as I've just said. There was a lot more work done on theoretical questions using primary data. There was a lot more statistically based analysis, which was better and more rigorous. There was a huge expansion in the number of academic programs that studied um, terrorism. I mean, it was mind boggling. <laughs> um, when, when I was, uh, you know, before 9-11, I was teaching a course at, at as um, you've already mentioned, Joe, at Georgetown. And it was focused on in the New York Times, that, that particular course. And a guy came and visited us and took pictures of us and all that. So it was really kind of considered an, uh, you know, something that was unusual. After 9-11, my God, everybody had major counterterrorism programs. And um, there was an increase, I think, by a factor of seven, according to one study, in the number of uh, academics who studied terrorism and a huge volume increase in the number of articles on terrorism. A lot more women study terrorism. This has been something I've had a lot of fun watching because in the field of security studies, especially in political science, there are very few women who study traditional security studies and they've had a hard time having a success of it. Not so in counterterrorism. Many women do specific field work in specific places. That's been great. Those who study domestic terrorism in the United States tended to be very few in number though and very oriented toward kind of writing toward each other. So there was this you know, group of people who did domestic stuff. And then there was this group of people who did, you know, Al-Qaeda and Jihad related stuff. And rarely the two did meet. Uh, that's a huge problem now, because I, I assume you'll give us a chance in a minute, Joe, to go looking into the future. And, uh, you know, those two communities need to get much more under, uh, aware of what each other are doing and to start to do uh, research that does the intersection of the two. Um, I worry a lot about the degree to which those who study terrorism sometimes develop um, conflicts of interest that they might not even realize are there. Um, they might take large government funding. Uh, they might, you know, even worry about the future of their own program. This is probably unconscious half the time, but I see, again, problems that are being defined as terrorism, which are oftentimes not or there's a kind of a tendency not to want to get into interdisciplinary work because that can kind of, you know, dissipate your attractiveness toward the traditional kind of policy relevant stuff on terrorism. Um, and if you reduce your profile, for example, if you're talking about how a group is, is reducing in its threat or how an organization might, heavens, potentially end, <laughs> you are not doing something that's generally speaking in the field career enhancing. So all a lot um, the sort of natural influences, even in academe, orient toward um, seeing the threat in very, very dire terms for very human reasons, but reasons I think that we have to be very careful to check ourselves against. So that's kind of the big, broad overview. I, the other thing I would add, and I would uh, pick up on the points that Aaron was making here, and also to some degree, uh, Mubin, is that our understanding of technology has been. Um, very poor. And I think that it's it's been a focus on guns and bombs in the, ter the study of terrorism. So I'm talking about not just communications technology, but also hardware and how people use it. That focus, it's been kind of the mantra for decades that that's the only thing that terrorists will use. And I personally believe that it's extremely anachronistic with digitally based uh, capabilities that give 
groups much greater reach. And we're going to be seeing a lot more of that uh, in the future. But I'll stop there. Thank you. Uh, and before we shift gears, does anybody want to comment on that? What Audrey said? I'll take prerogative and just say one quick thing, as I know John Mueller talks about this uh, kind of terrorism industry uh, as being one that thrives on itself and hyping it up and those sorts of things. And that's something I think those of us who study terrorism have to be very conscious of and that we're not in service of governments or in service of um, money or whatever else we're, we should be doing it for, you know, better reasons than that. Okay, yeah, I'm, so, I'm an admirer of his argument, but I would say that he kind of draws it to the opposite extreme. So let us together find the via media. Let's find the place where we can study things objectively and try to keep our own interests out of it. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Um, so Mubin, let me ask you a question about uh, training mil military forces who fight groups like ISIS. When you do this, what, what do you tell them and what has changed over these last 20 years? Yeah, and so, you know, most of my stuff really uh, kicked off. Uh, it started in 2013. I think by 2012, we had already seen, I was already interacting with people on Twitter uh, who were expressing interest to go to Syria and then who ended up going to Syria and then continued their conversing. Um, it was really a fascinating time. Really, I would say uh, 2013 to 2017 inclusive uh, were the busiest years Um uh, because I, for some crazy reason, uh, I had just gone onto Twitter and Facebook and decided, let me just talk to these guys, right? Let's just engage them. And and I was kind of like you know, the fact that I was uh, formerly an undercover and it obviously it, it didn't work too well with some people who once they realized that I was, you know, I clicked follow, uh, you know, once they realized I was following them, quote unquote, um, you know, they they let me know, you know, what they thought of me. Um, but others were, I think, readily uh, able and like and willing to engage with me uh, online and and I engage them and just you know even openly on Twitter but also in direct messages and on on Facebook as well in private messages and so on and really I think because of my own personal background I came from that you know radicalized mentality I understand the religious uh, you know narratives and uh, I could I could communicate with them in their language in the language of religion. Um, and so when now when I found myself trying to instruct military members as to like how to understand the ideology, but understand it in a way. So for example, like actually just today, I earlier today I was doing, a, I did a, a lecture for the Air Force Special Operations Command. And it was my last one because they're discontinuing it for a little while. But because it was 9-11 coming up, I thought it was really important to do it. Um, and one of the things I always try to explain is how to, it's really separating the religion from the interpretation, right? Like, because you have these people and it's just like 9-11, like, uh, you know, when I hear things like everything I learned, I needed to learn about Islam, I learned on 9-11, like that makes me cringe, right? Because it's like, ugh, like, that's not, that's not Islam. And so I wanted to, that was one thing that I wanted to really impress upon them that you need to understand separation between you know what the actual religion says versus what these people do and uh it it took time like in in a lot of places there i found that there just wasn't enough um training and education in these areas like whether it was world religions or world cultures or whatever it was it was still this like really you know one track minded top down um and and real lack of nuance and detail in that so that was one thing i really focused on is to get them to understand because if you don't understand your adversary properly, um, then you know you're you know you're you're going to just burning your tires, right? Spinning your wheels. Um, so the and the other thing, um, second thing was just on their tactics. Uh, so to really um, you know take examples of an attack or something and really break it down and just you know uh, dissect it across all its layers of like not just the role of ideology but everything else. Uh, because it's not just ideology, it's like ideology and grievances uh, and the interplay between the two um, or, you know, what drives somebody to, to commit these sorts of attacks. So whether it was in the Afghanistan or Iraq context of IEDs, um, uh, you know, there was this whole attack the network approach that militaries use uh, to understand that. But that was something that I found they could not really uh, apply to violent extremist, uh, violent extremist networks. And so that was another thing that I, I tried to kind of help them with. 
So, so all in all, it was really just to understand the cultural uh, landscape, uh, which I think we still don't understand, um, you know, to this day, not just in the military, but just in general across the board. And so, so really, I just tried to, you know, um, explain to them like how to view the adversary and, and, you know, the components that the elements that make up the adversary, not, oh, they're brown, they're Muslim, they're hajis, whatever, like very boorish and superficial understandings, which it, it just, you know, it just doesn't help, it doesn't help the mission objective. And I know you've been engaged beyond just kind of thinking about this in the context of Muslim communities, but in other, uh, this occurring in other sorts of communities. And I wonder if there's anything unique about dealing with this community versus another, or is this sort of a blanket lesson, which is we need, you need deep understanding of this to kind of combat it regardless of what religion or ethnicity or whatever we're talking about. Yeah, I, I like to say that radicalization is not a condition that only afflicts brown people. It is, it's a human process, psychological process that appears across the board. Doesn't matter your religion, race, nationality, political origin, it's, it's all the same. And it's, it's unfortunate that the topic of radicalization was kind of introduced because of what was happening post 9-11. And then everybody kind of thought, oh, radicalization, yeah, it's like, this is what the Muslims are doing. But now we're realizing, especially what's happening in the US on January 6th, is that, wait a second, it, it's actually, it's happening across the board. If the ingredients are there, it's like, let's call it the cupcake theory of radicalization. You know, if the, if the environment is right, the heat, the temperature is correct, and the ingredients are correct, you're going to get a cupcake. Um, and so it's, it's exactly what we're seeing now. That, that's great. Thank you. Uh, so we have a lot of interesting questions that we got in Q&A, and I, I'm going to sort of paraphrase uh, one of them to start with, because behind a lot of what we've been talking about is Afghanistan. Uh, and I think it's worth us discussing this and this goes to everybody. So it doesn't necessarily, um, you know, I'm not targeting one of you and everybody's well willing to answer, but sort of, okay, what does Afghanistan, what's happening in Afghanistan that sort of informs this bigger discussion and, and what, what are we missing? Audrey, you look like you're, you want to really, or are we all that shy? <laughs> no, I, I'll go first if you want me to. Um, sure. Very broad question. As I, as I explained, I, I thought we were right to invade Afghanistan in 2001. Uh, I thought we made a big mistake to immediately uh, fail to go after Al Qaeda, particularly bin Laden. And instead, um, right from the very beginning, 2001, we, we used a kind of a territorial holding occupation style approach in our, with our conventional forces. Was, remember now, it was a very small conventional footprint and it was the invasion was mainly led by the CIA and special operations forces. Remember all those guys on horses? I mean, I, this, my, my fellow panel members, this is very uh, basic stuff, but I, I find when I'm talking to folks in, in general audiences um, that they don't really remember that. We did not go into Afghanistan with the kind of nation building approach that we eventually adopted much later. So when we began to have violence in Afghanistan as a result of having invaded in Iraq and taking our attention away from Afghanistan, then there was an announcement by President Bush. This is about, I think it was about 2004. Don't hold me on the dates, but roughly. Uh, where he started talking about um, building the, uh, you know, schools and trying to help the Afghan people. And he essentially started to talk about nation building. And personally, I find those to be extremely laudable aims, but I have never heard once of a military outside external military force that has successfully done that, especially in Afghanistan. I got into terrorism because I was studying Afghanistan way back when. I speak Russian. Uh, I had studied the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. That's how I got into terrorism uh, and the study of terrorism throughout the 1990s. So uh, I just couldn't believe that, that we were beginning to go in this direction. And um, so here we are. Uh, you know, the end of combat operations was officially announced by Obama in 2014. And now we've just withdrawn in a calamitous way. I personally believe that it was the right thing to withdraw. We needed to end the uh, operation, not a popular point of view among many of my co-scholars on um, terrorism, counterterrorism. I do understand the increased risk potentially that uh, that entails, 
But I also think that most of the people who are arguing most vigorously about not getting out of Afghanistan are people who haven't actually deployed. <laughs> or if they did deploy, they were deploying only at senior levels. And this was beginning to exact a huge toll on the, uh, our American service members. And I personally do see a direct line between that toll and the kind of disaffection among some folks who have become um, very angry and potentially radicalized or even involved in conspiracy theories like QAnon and who may also have been in many cases, 12% of the folks who were engaged in the attacks of January 6th were um, current or former members of the armed forces. So um, that would be what I would say about Afghanistan. I really haven't gotten into detail about the threat there on the ground. But I do think, once again, giving the broad brush picture that it was the right decision to withdraw American forces, but I think it could have been um, executed uh, much, much better and planned much more in advance, the tactics of it. Yeah, and part of me, uh, I guess, was resigned to the fact that once we decided to be there, the ending would look like this, just not knowing when it would be exactly. And so at some level, it's like, okay, this happened in 2021, but it could have happened in 2018 or 2024. Um, I don't, it, I don't know how you feel about that. Is that, if that's a reasonable way to think about it? Well, very briefly, I, you know, for, on the one hand, I would say there's, there's a great book or dissertation to be written and it doesn't have enough material yet that's available in open sources for us to come to conclusions about exactly what went wrong. So the order of, in which the decisions were made and who was told what when is extremely important to what has happened in the last three months. So that's on the one hand, you know, we don't, those folks that are out there, pundits who are saying that they, you know, this was at fault and they should have withdrawn from Bagram, you know, not in July, but later. And these decisions are all interconnected and we don't have the data. We don't have, we don't really have insight into how that policy process unfolded. This being said, it's very clear that um, there was enough pressure from the uh, Afghan government um, that they did not want it to appear that they were being undermined by the removal of large numbers of Afghan citizens. And I think that must have played a role in putting off the uh, early removal of many of those SIV visa holders that should have gotten out. I, it just, it's just been horrifying and it breaks my heart to think of the folks that have been left behind. Um, I think that the American forces were heroic the, the loss of the 13 um, Marines, soldiers and sailor absolutely devastated me personally. Um, I've worked a lot with the military. You know, I, I really do think that they performed an extremely difficult mission as well as they possibly could, but there were a lot of politics going on that prevented us from um, executing that operation. I, I think it could have been done better. I really do. Had we, um, had we also had more senior diplomats in place, frankly. We, we have a large number of people that are still just waiting to be confirmed and um, our diplomacy isn't where it should be either. So all of those things uh, were unfortunate factors that I think were unique to this 2021 withdrawal. Move in or Aaron, you all have thoughts on generally about what's happening in Afghanistan, terrorism about, you know, related to this? We can move on to a new topic too, because we have plenty of uh, other questions. Or you go ahead, moving. I'm sorry. Well, just just very quickly, I'll just uh, kind of highlight the point about the uh, what the narrative looks like now in the jihadist world, uh, and how uh, you know they they've definitely taken this as a victory. Uh, we've vanquished another superhero, a superpower. That's the narrative. Uh, it's put the wind in the sails of not certainly well outside of Afghanistan. All these groups. Can now look and see. Remember, we were having these conversations about the Arab Spring and how Islamist movements there were like being held back and this and that. Well, this I think just reinforces the original, un, you know, first jihadist position, which is through jihad. Uh, this is the only way that you can get this kind of power. And so all these other groups have seen that. They're they're also, even if it's ISIS, they might on the surface be, you know, um, I mean, it be they are against the Taliban. But this idea that you can, you know, take power through jihad and have a government, this is something that they're very, very happy about. And it's going to be a problem for us as 
How, how are those lessons contrasted with kind of the fall of ISIS? So, you know, again, kind of in the chatter, like how is that this, this victory uh, thought about in contrast to how ISIS fell? I'm going to punt that to Aaron because I know he knows <laughs> the answer to that. <laughs> uh, well, I mean, uh, they try and delegitimize the Taliban saying that they're not truly a real Islamic emirate or state because of their ideology. Um, and, you know, some of the talking points, at least, that they've been doing in their public messaging to sort of allay the fears of many in the international community um, definitely feed into ISIS's position that they're um, not really living up to the true standards of what an Islamic state should be. Um, in terms of the original question, which I wanted to comment on, though, I think there are a number of things that we should think about. Um, you know, Al-Qaeda is not the same now as it was 20 years ago, let alone 10 years ago in terms of the AFPAC region. Many of its historical senior leaders have been killed in drone strikes. Um, and those that are involved with the group are much more localized instead of Arabs from abroad. They're more just people from Afghanistan or Pakistan or maybe Kashmir or Bangladesh and the like. There are, of course, still some historical leaders. Uh, Saif al Adil is in Iran, and there are a number of guys that have been in Syria the last few years who potentially could return, which could change the focus. I, I imagine in the immediate term, Al Qaeda will be primarily helping out the Taliban consolidate control locally, as well as potentially trying to build up a future front against Kashmir and India, um, since it's uh, closer and uh, you know there's support amongst that within a bunch of more localized Pakistani groups too um, but uh, it's it's plausible that because the Taliban hasn't actually controlled the full country before they might not be able to have their eyes on every single location and if we have some historical leadership return Al-Qaeda might try and rebuild its external operations capacities However, that's probably more of a medium to longer term potential issue. All right, so we are getting close to time, but I, I do wanna ask, because uh, there's a couple of questions in the Q&A about this, about white nationalist violence in the US and how that's going to affect kind of CT moving forward. And so we'll, we'll kind of try and get rapid thoughts here uh, as our last, last question. Oh, so that's the question, <laughs> just talk about yeah. it? Okay, sorry. Yeah. Let me, I, I do want to say rapid, rapid that, you know, we had three choices. You stay and you're an occupier, you leave and they won. I don't think that's the right narrative. And the third is we left voluntarily. So where are our narrative formulators? Where are our diplomats? Where are the people who can have that counter narrative that we withdrew? Not because we were driven out because <laughs> we, we were not driven out. So, you know, I, I really do think that the United States government needs to rebuild its ability to present itself more effectively uh, throughout the world. But getting to the domestic threat, um, I think that the intersections between, uh, let me put it another way, the relationship between how the domestic threat of its many different parts, anti-government, uh, white supremacist, uh, conspiratorial, um, you know, there's, there are lots of different elements within the so-called U.S. domestic threat. The degree to which they're intersecting now on um, trying to mimic the tactics of organizations like ISIS and ad actually admiring some of the sense of agency that they saw when it came to, um, well, they usually focus on tactics of ISIS, but, but even what's happening now with the withdrawal, the United States withdrawal, I mean, there's been an, a very alarming um, argument on some of the chat rooms and uh, among some of the folks that are involved in some of the groups that I follow, that basically we should be more like the Taliban. You know, we should, we, you know, look at those guys, they're really powerful dudes. And you know, we've sort of come, you know, 180 degrees from where we used to be. And that shows us that it isn't just ideology in the United States either. It's also a sense of, uh, in some cases, effects of the pandemic, some cases it's uh, demoralization after having left um, service and having deployed abroad, or in other cases, uh, you know, there are all kinds of different reasons why people are looking for agency uh, 
And they're actually, I think in some ways we're in a post-ideology world when it comes to uh, the United States domestic terrorist threat. I'll just jump in quickly to say um, what needs to be done is the, I think uh, just employing the tactics that law enforcement knows to be effective tactics. Uh, it's the same way that the mafia was broken down. It's the same way that biker gangs are investigated. All these other groups, whether it's sting operations or other kinds of undercover operations. Uh, the FBI actually has a better track record uh, with white nationalists than it does jihadists. In fact, if you go, you know, further real, you know, real early, uh, where, we, where they were very instrumental in smashing the KKK, for example. So I think uh, we're going to see a lot more of those. We're already seeing cases of that. Um, a blatant self-promotion here, uh, Parents for Peace, parentsforpeace.org. Uh, you know, we've been actually, we worked on the, it's public information, um, the uh, Wolverines, uh, Wolverine Watchmen, the, the group that was planning to govern, uh, kidnap Governor Whitmer of uh, Michigan. Uh, so Ty Garbin was one, one of the guys who just pled guilty recently. He was the only guy to plead guilty. We worked with him. Uh, we interviewed him, you know, for counseling purposes and whatnot. And there were undercovers involved in that too. And the same uh, narrative of, oh, it's all entrapment anyway, I'm, I'm starting to hear on the white nationalist side as well. So I think uh, that's the only thing that law enforcement can do is just to go after them. Uh, and if, hopefully if we can convince everyone to think their buddy next to them might be an undercover, so be it. Aaron, quick last word. Yeah, one thing very quickly, which I think will probably be a bit more relevant in the European context, is probably this issue of reciprocal radicalization where each side of the extreme radicalizes the other because they see each other as the mainstream of society when each side is the extreme and therefore creates this cycle of problems going forward because of this culture war going on within Europe itself. I wanna really thank the panelists. This was an amazing discussion. I wish we had another couple hours because we just scratched the surface of so many things and have a lot of questions we still need to answer. But I really uh, am thankful that everyone took their time to do this and to come to the event. And thanks so many people for showing up. And just so you know, this is part of a bigger SIS event series 20 years after 9-11. There's another event going on tomorrow that SIS professor Shadi Maktari is gonna moderate a panel discussion on the impact that 9-11 has had on human rights and political change in the US and Middle East. So. Thank you, everybody.